Hello, everybody, and welcome to our final video lecture. It's been quite the course, at least I think so. I hope you have as well. Of course, framing it that way leaves open what exactly you mean by it's been quite the course. I hope you let me know and do a course evaluation. I'd really love to hear your feedback, both on the, the course materials, the, the readings, the films, the assignments, right? Sort of the, the structure of the course, the content of the course, uh, as well as on, on me, on, on how I've delivered that content, how we've gone through it. Any comments are, are welcome, whether it be telling me something you really liked, pointing at something that you think can be improved, or just telling me about something that really didn't suit your fancy, even if you're not quite sure how it could be made better. So I really appreciate your feedback and if you take a few moments to fill out evaluation before they close. Now with that, let's go ahead and jump into our final piece of course material, Derek Parfit's piece, Personal Identity. Now, this is a, a fairly long and, and somewhat difficult piece, so I'm gonna do my best to break it down and, and explain really the most important points. Uh, now, Parfit himself was a very influential English philosopher. He really spent his career at uh, Oxford, University of Oxford, England. Um, Oxford University. He um, was there for quite a number of years, wrote on a number of issues, really influential in the field of personal identity as well as ethics. Uh, we're reading a, his, his piece here, Personal Identity from 1971. Now he worked for years on, on these issues and uh, eventually came out with a, probably his most famous um, text collection is a two volume set called Reasons and Persons which deals with personal identity and ethics, um, nature of rationality, all kinds of things. And it's the big, huge, fat books, just massive. So this is somebody that worked a very long time developing his thoughts uh, and, and sort of putting them out and, and letting them develop over time and trying to interact with a lot of other people thinking on issues. Uh, so he might be a little hard to follow if you just sort of do the reading, but I hope to make really what he's getting at a little bit more clear here and draw at least a few connections, particularly to Moon. Uh, now I've bypassed my usual little, you know, I've broken this into three points. Um, just gonna sort of move through it. I have marked off sort of what's going on with the use of some titles here. So first, Parfit tells us near the start of his piece, really what he's trying to do and what he wants to do is target, really criticize, object to, two beliefs concerning personal identity and he wants to uh, give us some reason to reject both. The first is that questions about personal identity must be answerable. In fact, Parfit thinks uh, there aren't always answers. Right? We're, we're often motivated by this thought that uh, when we look at some sort of case, you know, say what's going on with, with Dion or Chappie or um, Sam Bell, that we need to be able to say, yes, that's the same person, or no, it's not. Parfit thinks that's actually a little too quick. That's, that's not the right sort of attitude to have. In fact, as we're gonna see, what he wants to do is complicate these questions to make us more sensitive to um, details and varieties of nuance. The second belief he wants to examine and ultimately criticize is that other important questions, namely ethical questions, cannot be answered unless we have uh, answers to the questions of identity, right? Whether or not we are the same person uh, after an event as, as before, right? And ultimately, what Parfit is going to try to get out, I'll just sort of cut to the chase for this uh, second part, is that in particular questions of ethics really don't depend on questions of personal identity. Part of what Parfit wants to criticize precisely are self-interested, egoistic uh, concerns in, in ethics and, and you know, moral theories. So the whole notion of putting ourselves first, putting our self-interest first, Parfit thinks is not natural. Uh, it's, it's not sort of a natural inclination. We're not all just these self-interested little egoistic beings running around trying to do what's best for us. He says, that's, that's now he doesn't fully get to it here, but he sort of suggests that he's, says that's really a result of, of learning to think a certain kind of way. And if we give up thinking that way, and in fact, what he's trying to do here is, is argue that we should, we shouldn't be so interested in regarding ourselves as these, um, sort of little units, these the atoms of personhood that exist from the time we're born to the time we die. 
What he wants to move us toward is instead actually looking at ourselves, not just in science fiction scenarios and, and things like that, but ourselves as we are now, just as, as humans living our normal human lives, as in fact, beings whose personal identity shifts over time, that we do in fact normally have the right sorts of relations between our, our past and future selves um, to do the work that we require of it for questions of you know, moral responsibility and, and you know, perhaps uh, legal rights to say property and things like that. But we shouldn't try to stick to them uh, quite as tightly as we often do. So just to give you a quick little example, uh, and, and you can reframe this for yourself, and I, I encourage you to do so and sort of stop for a moment and think about this. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I guess I'm sort of middle-aged now or, or thereabouts. Uh, and I can look back over five years or 10 years or 15 or 30 and think about what I was like. And I, you know, as I was talking about last time, I'm talking about Locke and so on, I can remember certain things happening. There are other things that people attribute, oh, this happened to you, I don't recall. There are all sorts of other things that no doubt happened to me or I mean, happened to someone that, you know, is, is spatio-temporally continuous with me. Uh, but nobody remembers, right? Well, let's, let's say at some point when I was six, I don't know, some jerk on the playground pushed me over and called me a name. I, I don't remember that happening. Let's say they don't either. Let's say nobody does. And there's no photograph of it or right, there, there's really no sort of evidence that is ever going to tell us that it happened. Um, now, in fact, that event may have occurred, right? Maybe it did. I don't know. Um, but I don't need to fixate on it so much. Right? That happened to someone. I am the, the closest living person who now exists to that, that someone, right? I am closest to being that person uh, of anybody who now lives. Does that mean I am the same person as that? Well, I don't even remember what I said, six-year-old or something, uh, you know, got pushed down on, on the playground and you know, called a name, right? Is that really me? Am I the same person? Well, no, I'm not six anymore, right? Things have obviously changed. Um, to what extent am I the same person? Ah, as soon as we ask that, to what extent am I the same person now as I was then? Now we're thinking in terms of matters of degree, right? What's similar? What's different? A lot is different, right? What's similar? Mm, a few little things. I still call the same people my parents and so on. Um, but you know what? What else? Oh, so much has changed. Right? So much has changed. What I do on a given day, where I live, right? Um, people I, I communicate with, how I communicate with them, how I regard myself, how I, I behave, right? So much has changed. Well, what's going to change in another 30 years, right? How different will I be from what I am now? It's, it's an open question. I might be significantly different. I might be largely similar. Right? But presumably there will be changes. So what Parfit wants to move us towards precisely is this question about not looking at ourselves as sort of, yes, I'm the same person or no, I'm not seeing this as a sort of black and white binary issue, but rather as a, a matter of degree, as something that we can look at in different sorts of ways. And in fact, the ways in which we look at it will help influence the way we think about ethics and how we ought to treat each other. So what we see Parfit ultimately doing in this piece, now we, like a lot of the other pieces we've had, he talks about a lot of things. I'm not gonna try to explain all of it, you know, I could, and that would be a, a video that would be probably several hours long and going through all sorts of, you know, paragraphs, sentence by sentence. Well, this is what this means, this is what this means. But that doesn't seem very helpful to any of us. So let's just cut to the, the thought experiments that he talks about through the piece and how those challenge this notion of personal identity being this um, sort of black and white binary issue that has to be answerable and that has some sort of primary importance to other important questions about ethics and, and how, you know, and questions of responsibility. Remember, this is exactly how Locke framed it, right? Locke exactly says person is a forensic term. It's really a matter of reward and punishment, about moral and legal desert. That's really why we care about personal identity. And, and Parfit, in some sense, says, well, yes, right, as, as a matter of fact, that is a lot of the reason we care about it. Uh, but then the way we view personal identity really has has implications for how we view those things. And we can sort of rearrange the pieces. We can think more about the moral sphere first and then come to regard personal identity as, as something related to that. 
So thought experiments and their implications. So throughout here, you're going to see TE as an abbreviation that just means thought experiment. Thought experiment, we've already talked about this in the course, but just a brief reminder, a kind of, you know, mental uh, example, right? Just something we cook up, right? Not necessarily something that actually has, has happened or will happen, but, you know, something that at least could happen. It's logically possible. Um, formulated as a kind of example or, or experiment to try to make some kind of point. So, the first thought experiment is the brain transplant case. And this is really where a brain, brain, a brain, brain is transplanted from one body to another. And uh, um, part of it basically just puts it this way, right? And this one seems pretty straightforward. Your brain is transplanted into somebody else's brainless body, and the resulting person has your character and apparent memories of your life. Most of us would agree after thought that the resulting person is you. Right? We sort of locate personal identity and, and memory and, and character and so on. And we locate those physically, right, at least these days, in the brain. That's where we think all this stuff is, is going on, at least in some important sense. So if we took your brain and stuck it in my body, right, we'd now think that you were, you still existed, but you were stuck here in, in Carl's body. And perhaps, you know, if we swap brains, right, I'd have your body and you'd have mine. Much like the Prince and the Cobbler when we're talking about Locke. Um, so on this, uh, right, and, and Parfit agrees, right, um, he doesn't think it's, it's really problematic to think really, in fact, the resulting person would be you after that transplant case. Where he says, here, you know, intuition seemed to track fairly well. Um, and th there doesn't seem to be any particularly good reason to deny that the resulting person is you. Now, the split brain case, this, this is exactly where we start to get more complicated. So Locke, in many ways, uh, restricted himself in some sense to something like the brain transplant case. But now we've got the split brain case where you take a brain, so they cut it in two, put each half into a different body, right? So we take my brain, right, and two other people, right? We scoop out the brains from the other two people. We split my brain down the middle, put uh, half the brain into each of the, the other bodies. Now what? Right? Now, now what, do we, what do we think? What's our intuition? Uh, do I still survive? Am I one of those two people or am I both? Because what we have here is something very similar to the, the uh, brain transplant case, right? But times two. Now we have two different people, so it seems, walking around, right? We have two different bodies. They both have part of my brain, say an equal part of my brain. They each have half, right? We can even like measure it out and weigh them or something to make sure they're the same. Assume for the sake of the thought experiment, that they function in the same way as well, right? So we split the brain in two, but each of the resulting persons, each of the resulting bodies walks around, they have my character, they, they act like me, they behave like me, they claim to have memories like me, right? So you can think about this, uh, something like, you know, with what's going on on the moon, uh, say we have a scenario like this where we split my brain, we put it into two different bodies, um, but we don't tell either of the resulting people what's going on. So they, they each wake up, right, in, in a separate room, something like this. They each come to regard themselves as having been me, right, Carl, now having their brain transplanted into a different body. Just nobody happens to tell them that there's, a, there's another one, right? There's a second one. There's a second half of the brain wandering around in the body, also thinks it's Carl, has the same memories, and so on. What do we think now? Parfit says there's really three possibilities. It seems like there's only three. First, you don't survive. You're dead. Second, you survive as one of the two people. Or three, you survive as both. Pause for a moment. Just think, what do you think is the most plausible answer here? Right? Um, you did not survive? Well, maybe. But now we have really two, two people walking around in much the same way as they were in the brain transplant case. Um, and if we thought in the brain transplant case that we the person survived, right? Carl would have survived the brain transplant or you would have survived the brain transplant. Tra transplant. It seems a little bit weird that in this case, you don't survive, right? Um, as Parfit sort of paraphrases, how can a double success be a failure? We thought the brain transplant case worked. How does the two, ver you know, that happening twice count as a failure? You survive as one of the two people, right? Well, maybe it's that, but how could it be that? Right? How, how would you pick which one it was? Like I said, you know, imagine we sort of weighed the brains equally and they had all the same memories and characteristics, right? They were both qualitatively uh, similar to the 
pre-existing person, right, say Carl. Um, so there, there's no test we can run to see which one is sort of closer. Right? They're both just as close. Now they're both in different bodies, right? And of course, by putting them into different bodies, this helps cut off saying, well, right, if we had split my brain, left half of it in my original body, and then put half of it in a, in a different body, that will give us some reason to say that I am still me, but now we've got something like a duplicate or a copy or, or something like that, because now it's half my brain in a different new body that's wandering around thinking it's me. So three, you survive as both people. That seems weird, right? How, how does that work? Because now it seems like one person has become two. Think Sam, Bell, and Moon. Parfit thinks three is really the best candidate. And this is what we are going to see happen. So uh, Parfit likes three. He, he thinks this is really the best. He thinks, and this is where it gets sort of weird, you know, you aren't either of the two people. Right? But you survive as two people. So he wants to decouple the notion of survival from the notion of identity, right? Who we are and, and surviving is something separate from being some one individual person. And it's only that intuition we have that personal identity is the sort of, of yes, no, on, off, one, zero, you know, black and white sort of issue that leads us to believe that we couldn't survive as two people. Right? Uh, we could also say, instead of uh, that we survive as two people, but neither of them are strictly us, that the two people, in fact, right, that these two bodies are actually still one person with two bodies. Right? It's two bodies with a divided mind. And this brings us to the uh, third case that he thinks about, and he's got some other ones that we're going to come around to in a little bit as well. The exam case, he says, imagine here, right, so we've got the whole split brain case. So imagine we could master and figure out how to voluntarily disconnect the bridge between the two hemispheres of the brain. Right? So we've got these two different hemispheres in our brain. They run different sorts of operations. Now, as a matter of fact, they're linked together, but there have been surgeries done to decouple these things in people. And it, it uh, seems right, that they can each function independently. Now, again, I'm, I'm not going to get too much into the neuroscience because I don't want to put my foot in the, my mouth and, and make a bunch of claims that, you know, if you're out there studying neuro and you're going, that's not right. Okay, right. I'm not a neuroscientist. You've done really any kind of neuroscience course. You probably know more than I do. Um, but I at least have some rough sense of, of how these things work. So let's say, at least for the sake of art, right, let's assume that this is how it works, even if you don't say, well, that's not really, that's not exactly how it can work. Uh, Perfect says, imagine you can voluntarily somehow, I don't know, you've got a switch or something, disconnect the two hemispheres of your brain so you can let them function independently for a while. So he says, imagine you're writing an exam and you saw you know, a math problem um, and you saw two different ways of trying to approach the problem. So to save time, you decoupled the, the hemispheres in your brain. You let each hemisphere take half your body. So one had one eye and, and one hand and was working over here on, on one way to you know, solve the equation your other side was working on a different way to solve the equation. Now they could each sort of look over to see that the other one was doing something, but they wouldn't be consciously aware of what the other side was doing as it was happening. Once you flick the button again, and the two hemispheres came together, right, you reconnected that bridge, as a single person, right, would regard you as a single person, certainly before and after you had disconnected them. After you've come back together, you can recall both sets of experiences. You have memories of both sets of experiences. Right. Parfit thinks this example makes saying you survive the split brain as one person with two bodies at least possible. But it's unsatisfactory because in this case, your two minds reconnect after a short time and you only have one body, although they share it. Right here, saying that you're one, one person surviving in, in two bodies where it doesn't really make sense. In the split brain case, you have two bodies and two minds that don't reconnect. Whereas here, you have one body and a mind that can either be sort of singular, one, one stream of consciousness, one set of memories, or can branch off into sort of two at a time and then come back together. Right? Now, ultimately, what Parf Parfit is trying to get at, especially with the split brain case and the exam case, is that we should decouple the notions of survival and identity, like I was saying. One person can survive as two or more persons without being those persons. Identity is a one-one relation where survival is not. And so what we need to do is try to start getting away from running these things together.
So Parfit's first conclusion is that we should, or that is that the relation of the original person to each of the resulting people contains all that interests us, all that matters, in any ordinary case of survival. This is why we need a sense in which one person can survive as two. Okay. So this is ultimately what he wants to drive us towards, getting away from uh, privileging that sense of personal identity as this one-one relation, this sort of, you know, one-zero, yes-no, on-off sort of, of relation, and instead start focusing more on questions of survival and how um, survival functions and how it can be a matter of degree. And so ultimately, Parfit thinks we get the relation of personal identity and what really matters, right? Our, our questions of value and ethics and, and uh, morals backwards, right? So for instance, psychological continuity, a notion we're gonna come around to uh, shortly here is something you know, really important he wants to define. Uh, you know, we, we think psychological continuity matters and it might be a sufficient condition for personal identity, right? If you're psychologically continuous, it might mean you're the same person. But personal identity isn't important independently of questions of things like psychological continuity, right? And who deserves what? Okay, so now we're gonna come around to questions of memory. So, like in Locke's account, we tend to think that memory is pretty darn important for personal identity, right? And when we're thinking about something like the brain transplant case, often we think one of the most important things is precisely the continuation of memories from one, one body or one being to another, and that's where we really find personal identity. And this is really Locke's whole account, right? You know, if I remember something um, that happened before, even if it, I, I was in a different body, it's really that, that memory and that self-identification, hey, that happened to me, that matters. This is also, uh, this you know, memory of, of being central importance is something that we really find in the sort of converse case. You have the same body and we might not think it's the same person if you have something like total amnesia. This is exactly what Locke was talking about as well, right? Imagine there's, there's some part of my life that just completely is, is gone, right? I have no memories of it. I have no self-identification with it anymore. Right. Um, that certainly seems like it's not me then. Now, Parfit agrees that, that memory seems particularly important, but he, he notes sort of in the, the footnotes uh, that there was an early critic of Locke who effectively charged that Locke's account was, was basically circular and really not informative. Because if we say that memory is what matters, um, if by memory, what we mean is, is that, you know, the only way that you can remember something is if you're already the same person as to whom it happened to. Now, I was talking about this the other day uh, in, in the video about Locke. What's the difference between me remembering something that happened to me as a kid and me imagining something happened to me as a kid, but then self-identifying with it, you know, ha having that feeling saying, oh, yeah, you know, I've got this, I'm sort of imagining this thing, and I guess it happened to me, right? There, there can be those borderline cases right in the middle where we're not sure if it's just like a vivid Im imagining that we're having or actual memory. Right? So if by memory, we mean you are thinking, you're, you're representing something that really happened to you, then there has to be some other way of figuring out who you really are. Otherwise, we have no way of distinguishing between a remembering and just a, a, an imagining, right? Two different kinds of representation. So now, perfect isn't, all that interested in, in that sort of criticism, though it's an interesting one. Right? Uh, but he is interested in um, trying to sketch an account of what he calls Q memory to try to free it from uh, certain sorts of presuppositions of personal identity, right? So the basic idea is, is uh, this. Um, actually, uh, let, me, let me take that point back. It says, I'm Q remembering an experience if, one, I have a belief about a past experience that seems in itself like a, belief, uh, a memory belief, right? So you have a belief about some past experience which seems like a memory. Two, someone did have such an experience, right? At least somebody had that experience. And three, my belief is dependent upon this experience in the same way, whatever it is, in which a memory of an experience is dependent upon it. And there's some sort of causal relation between them, right? The event really happened and that's what produced the memory. It wasn't just sort of a, a, an imagining or something like that. So a cue memory is like a memory, 
But unlike in that criticism of, of Locke I was just talking about, and so Perfit's not trying to defend Locke, but he is trying to sketch this, this sort of account of Q memory to separate memory from the presupposition that you can only remember something happening if it really happened to you in the first place. So Parfit wants this, this account. Q memory is, is like a memory, right? It's, it's a belief we have about a past experience that the experience really occurred to someone. It was something that really happened. Um, and you come to have that belief in, in a way, whatever that way is, um, you know, like the way in which memory is formed. Okay. So it had to have actually happened to someone and so on. It can't just be sort of completely made up. So here, to try to make this concrete, think about in Moon, right? The clones of Sam Bell. So there's the original Sam Bell, who actually had experiences with, say, Tess, his wife, right? Um, now, those experiences, different, different parts of Sam's past, right, his, his memories, have been inserted as implants into the clones. And we're told this by Gert. Now, do the clones actually remember, uh, you know, being with Tess and, and all, all the things that Sam did before sort of being up on, on the moon? Well, no, they don't remember it. They don't have memories of those things. If by memory we mean that uh, the, those beliefs they had and, and that kind of identification they have with those past events, only comes about because they themselves did it, right? But rather, we can say that they cue remember it because in fact, just think about Parfit's uh, criteria, they have beliefs about, about the past that seem like memories, right? Someone in fact did have such an experience, the original Sandell. And third, the beliefs uh, that they have is dependent upon that experience that the original Sandell had uh, in the same way in which a memory of an experience is dependent upon. That is, they only have those memories because the original Sam Bell actually had those experiences. Now, of course, there's that intervening process where it gets sort of inserted into them, right? But they are uh, cue memories, right? Because they aren't mere imaginings. They aren't, they don't seem like memories, but they're about events that never occurred. Rather, they are about events that actually occurred to someone, right? Uh, there just happens to be this intervening stage before they, they wind up in the clone. Now, Parfit notes that we can have this kind of account of all sorts of activities, you know, things like intentions and desires and, and uh, you know, promising and so on. We can have cue promises and cue intentions and cue desires that we can separate these from the presupposition that they are connected to individual people. Right? So, for instance, a cue desire, say the original Sam Bell has a desire to work on his temper. Like that was, and this is something we see play in the film. The most recent clone to awaken has, has sort of a, a you know, temper and he flies off the handle and he knows he has to do something about it and so on. The clone has been around for a while, has done something about it. He's, he's mellowed out, he's slowed down, he's, he takes it easier, right? Um, and so what we have there is this cue intention from the original Sam Bell, right? Oh, I need to do something about my temper. This is part of why Tess and I broke up and she moved back in with her parents. And, you know, I, I need, to, I need to work on myself. So the original Sam Bell has this intention. Now, do the clones have the same intention Sam did, right? Well, not exactly the same if they have to be the exact same person as he is, because it seems pretty obvious they're not the exact same person because he's down there on earth, back with Eve, right? So then what do they have? Well, if we start thinking in terms of Q intentions, now we can regard them as sharing that, that Q intention. The original Sam had this, um, had this intention, they also had the same intention, right? But you can share the same intention even if you aren't the same person. Now, Parfit notes that with the account of, of Q memory, it might seem a little odd uh, because right now, just as a matter of fact, the memories that we do have really are only of us, right? We don't share memories with other people. Right now, of course, one way to interpret that is that we don't tell people about our memories. That's not what I mean, right? What I mean is that we don't literally share within our minds memories of other people. You, know, you can tell me about your memories and I can tell you about my memories. But you don't actually have my memories, right? When you think back to past events and you know, oh, what was I doing in sixth grade or whatever, you don't remember the same things I do. Right, and like, like you know, if we were both there, right, we grew up together or something. Maybe we remember the same event occurring, but we don't remember it the same way. 
uh, because our, our memories are really, in some sense, about, uh, about us and our experience of the world, though Parfit thinks it's not the case that we automatically um, identify in a strong way with our memories. So we don't only really say, oh, here's exactly how I experienced, rather we think about something that happened. It happens to be from our point of view, though. Now, if we were living in a world, right, say like, like in Moon, where it's still, it's an unusual thing what's going on with the clones of Sam, right, and we find this at the end of the film. Um, if we lived in a world where it was more common to share memories somehow, right, we could uh, have memory implants or we had, I don't know, like neural helmets like they do in Chappie and we could, you know, hook up to our neural helmets and exchange memory somehow or, or right, we could like transfer data between each other so I could literally have some of your memories and you could have mine. Right, if we started to do that, all of a sudden this whole account of Q memory might seem a lot more plausible, right? Right now we assume when we remember something or have a belief that seems like a memory that it's about our experience somehow, that it's our memory. Right? But if in fact we came to start having beliefs about the past uh, and we started realizing that they weren't all from our point of view, they, they didn't originate from us, then the whole notion of Q memory might seem a lot more applicable. Parfit thinks with this whole Q account, as he puts it, it might be possible to think of experiences in a wholly impersonal way. Rather than thinking about our memories and our attentions and uh, right, all, all those other things that we often think of as being connected to or sort of indexed to each of us individually, what we might be able to start doing is really starting to see these things in a sort of impersonal way, right? Someone had uh, this sort of belief, right? You know, I have this belief because somebody had this experience. I have this desire because somebody else had this desire. I'm whatever it is, right? Now, this would not be wholly giving up on the notion of, of personhood, right? And saying, I, we're gonna get around to this later, Carver thinks there's situations where that might just not even really make sense anymore. Uh, but we could start, in, in some sense, loosening up over questions of ownership of beliefs and experience and so on. All right, and this is where we come to this issue of survival being a matter of degree. So I have some more thought experiments, right? Now, Perfect gives these thought experiments. He doesn't really name them, which I always find unfortunate. Um, it, it just seems like a good branding exercise and a good sort of heuristic, a good thing to help with, with memory and, and just talking about it in an efficient way to give names to these things. So one thought experiment he gives is fusion. And this is really where two people combine into one. So rather than, it's basically the reverse of the split brain case. So in the split brain case, we take one individual, split their brain, stick in two bodies right now. Do we have two people or not? Or the same person, two bodies, right? Fusion is where you have two different people, say me and you, right? We sort of split the brains down the middle and we put half of my brain, half of your brain, and you know some other body. Now what? What, what do we do with that? Right? How, how does that result? So this is really um, in, in bringing the, the two people together. Parfit thinks we're going to have features that combine in fairly predictable ways. He thinks right. Some features are going to be compatible with other traits. Right. Some will be incompatible, and these traits can probably emerge in a fairly predictable arithmetic kind of way. So he's, he gives, you know, an example, um, say you have two people who like art, right? Uh, but they like slightly different kinds of art. Well, the new person's probably gonna like both kinds of art, right? Say one person likes art a lot, the other one is kind of a bit one about art. Um, uh, and then, you know, flip it around and, and say, right, the one who doesn't really like art really loves cooking and the one who really loves art doesn't really like cooking. The resulting person is probably gonna like art and like cooking to some degree, right? Probably like neither of them super strongly, but like both of them somewhat, right? So, so on any kind of characteristic, one really likes it, one is just ambivalent, they're probably gonna wind up liking it. Not as strongly as before, but right, if sort of one's a 10 and one's a five, you're gonna get like a seven and a half, right? Um, on a scale, assuming five is, is neutral, right? Somebody hates it, right? It's a one, somebody absolutely hates art, the other person loves it, right? So a, a one, maybe it'd be a zero, right? Zero, no interest in art whatsoever, hate it, dislike it, right? The other one's a 10. Well, the resulting person will probably be ambivalent. They'll get the five or something like this. I assume we can have a numerical scale like that. Uh, traits being, um, uh, that's really, you know, the, the incompatible traits is, is where one person likes it and the other one hates it. Uh, we can also think about, he gives the example of saying, you know, like political views, 
right? If one person's like really liberal and the other one's very conservative, and if we assume those things are incompatible, right? Those are opposite traits in some sense. Uh, then the resulting person is probably going to be just kind of in the middle, right? They're not going to be committed one way or the other. They'll be as you put it, sort of a floating voter, kind of a free agent. Now, Parfit doesn't think this kind of fusion results in death, right? Um, the resulting person is going to wind up being different from the, the initial two people, right? And we can assume that they'll have the same, the memories from those same two people, right? Just like in the, the exams case, all of a sudden you have a resulting person that shares the memories of both. And then, of course, that'd be a little bit weird because they could think back, you know, like, what, what were you doing when you were 20, right? And they got two different sets of memories of what they were doing when they were 20, right? But then again, when we think back right now to what we're doing at some earlier time, Right. You know, no matter how old you are, right? think back five years or 10 years or 15 years, we have memories of a bunch of different things, right? assuming you have memories of a bunch of different things, right? um, but they don't all sort of add up together. Right? I, I don't know about you, um, but I'm, I'm fairly confident. Most people don't have full track, you know, uh, full stock of memories about everything they did over the course of a certain year. Right? Instead, we remember certain things about the year right? or, or certain things about that decade in our life or, or, you know, period in our life, you know, or, oh, when we were in high school or whatever, right? You know, sort of say like, oh, yes, yeah, so on January 22nd, 2014, right? I remember I had waffles for breakfast and then I did this, right? Which would then make it weird if you had two sets of memories. I remember I had waffles for breakfast. No, I didn't. I had yogurt for breakfast. I didn't have the two together. I had two separate breakfasts, right, at the same time in different places, right? Well, how would that be possible? It, it probably just wouldn't strike us as odd, especially if we shifted to something like Q memory. Right? We would have these beliefs about past events. We represent them as having actually occurred to us. But we'd also realize that we are not the same person now as we were then. Hey, doesn't that sound an awful lot like what I was talking about, just being a normal human anyway? We look back and think about who we are now versus who we were then. Right? But, you know, we've, we've got different memories, different abilities. We might be living in a different place, interacting with different people, having different habits. Right? Uh, we just see the world in a different way. Think, you know, our experience changes. Right. The way I experience the world now that I'm in my you know, mid-30s is just different than it was when I was in my mid-20s or my mid-teens, right? Um, frankly, the transition from mid-teens to mid-20s, I quite liked. From mid-20s to mid-30s, uh, I haven't decided if I, I quite like it or not. But, um, you know, not like I can roll back the clock. I can pretend, right, and, you know, get into a full midlife crisis pretty soon and, I don't know, buy a convertible. I, well, okay, that actually sounds kind of fun. But, uh no, it's happening. It's happening, right? Okay. Um, but this is exactly what, what Parfit is trying to get to, right? Um, some people might look at fusion as, as a kind of death, precisely because if we're, we're just looking at you as an individual and we're thinking about what to expect if you hadn't fused with somebody else, we would think you'd be quite a different person, right? Qualitatively, you'd have different memories, you'd have different tastes and interests, you'd, you'd behave in different sorts of ways. So it's, it's survival, but it's not straightforward uh, in the sense of, of what we might think, right? You're not going to be as closely related to who you were as you would have been had you not had the, the fusion case going on. Um, some people do claim, and, and Parfit's, you know, interacting with other philosophers here. He says some people do claim that fusion really is death, right? They say, you know, if this actually happens, you really are dead. And he says that's not an entirely absurd position, right? It's, it's not wholly implausible to think it that way. But Parfit thinks ultimately that's unwarranted. And he gives an example. He says, look, the case is pretty similar to marriage, right? Insofar as the resulting couple has traits, some set of traits based on the two individuals that make it up, right? And marriage is not, or at least need not be, death, right? We might in fact welcome certain changes to our character and thus to who we are as a person. So fusion might actually be a welcome case, right? So you've got a very serious anger problem, Sam Bell, and you wanna work on it, right? Well, if you fuse together with somebody who's really mellow, right? Like think, think about the two clones of Sam. What if we could somehow merge them together? Right? We merge their consciousness together, do the split brain thing or something. You know, we wanted to save the, the sort of ill clone of Sam by sticking him in the, the newer clone's body. So we split his brain and split the new Sam's brain, right? Stick, stick them both in. So now they merge together, right? So now they're sort of more angry than the really mellow older version, but they're much more chill than the, the new sort of, you know, fresh clone. Right, um, we might want changes like that. Right, we might welcome these sorts of things. Just like, as as Parfit's saying, um, you know, if you, depending on how you view marriage, once you uh, become married, if we look at at the the resulting couple as really a unit, 
rather than as two individual people, then as a couple, they've got certain traits, right? One really loved art, the other one really doesn't like it. Together, they sort of are ambivalent about art, right? Um, now, maybe that's not right to, not the right way to look at marriage, right? Sure, and we can object to perfect on those grounds, perhaps. Next thought experiment. So we got the fusers, right? The, the fusion case. Then we also have splitters, beings who reproduce by process of natural division. Now he's got a diagram, so here it is, right? So we start with A, right? And that splits, right? So A splits, you know, think of like amoeba or, you know, some kind of like germ or something, where one splits into two, right? So A splits into B1 and B2. So you have that initial branch is A, and then it breaks off into two branches. And then from each of those two branches, you see that there are further breaks, right? So B2 splits off, or B1 splits off into, um, so B1 and B2, B1 splits off into B3 and B4, right? Uh, B2 splits uh, off into B5 and B6, right? And then each of those branches as we go down splits into two again, so it's, it's divided, right? So one turns into two, two turns into uh, four, four turns into eight, eight turns into 16, and, and so on. In each case of division, right, the resulting two people will be like virtually identical to the one who split. Really what you have is a kind of twinning going on, right? One becomes two, but the two of them, as of the time of the split, are basically exactly the same. Here again, think about the clones of, of Sam Bell, right? Um, if we clone Sam Bell and had the memory implants and everything, and say we could do this process incredibly quickly, so within five minutes, we had a full exact duplicate clone of Sam Bell with all the same memories and everything, the only difference between them would be that intervening five minutes. Right? And say we could even sedate the original sand bell during that intervening period. So when they both woke up, they would be qualitatively identical. Right? Uh, so much so that unless we sort of intentionally did something to add an identifier to the clone, could be the case that we, we could just get mixed up about who's who. Remember I said, you know, imagine we had two copies of, of the same book and they were virtually identical. There was no way to tell them apart. They had no differing feature. We stuck them in the dryer. Right? Some kind of tumbling device that my dryer, you can't see it. Um, so, you know, imagine we put them in the dryer for five minutes and then open the dryer up. Well, which book is which? Well, we wouldn't know. Imagine we did the same thing with these two clones of Sam Bell. We stuck them in the dryer for five minutes. <laughs> so maybe a carnival ride that's the equivalent, uh, where they sort of tumble together. And if we had no way of identifying them, right, no, nothing we could do with the genetic, genetics or, you know, we didn't add an identification to them or anything like that, uh, how would we know which one was which, right? Wouldn't they be just basically the same person? It'd be like we had two copies of exactly the same person, right? Now, the relation between um, the, the one who split, right, and, and the duplicate, as Parvin says, is just as good as survival, right? Um, they're so close. And in fact, it's only over time that they're going to grow apart, having different experiences, adding new memories, and so on. And so Parvin says, you know, in the case of that split, what you have is something that's just as good as survival, and it's effectively the same as someone today versus who they are tomorrow, right? Who I am today, I'm not exactly the same person I was yesterday. Not in some big, right? I didn't have an epiphany last night or, right? Any, right. There's like, there's no, nothing huge happened, right? There's nothing, it's not like I, I was visited by a divine being. No, it just, right, another day went by. I've got some new memories, right? Slightly new attitudes, it's a new day, right? Little changes, right? Um, and there are little changes. So we admit, right, in cases of personal identity, when we're not dealing with weird scenarios like splitters or clones or, or anything like that, that we slowly change over time. But we don't think those slow gradual changes are enough to make us a different person. In the case of the splitters, right, we had one original person, they split into two, but those two are basically one. And over time, they gradually develop, but they, you know, let's say, at least for the sake of argument, they develop sort of separately, right? So say I split, me and, and the new Carl would basically be the same person. But let's say the new one, I don't know, packed up and moved to Finland, why not? Right, and I stayed here in, in Lethbridge, um, and over time, right, he, another one made new friends and, and all this stuff, and got a different career and whatever, right? Uh, over time, give us 20 years, we probably wind up being pretty different people. Now, of course, I could have developed in the way he did, and he could have de developed in the way I did. So we could have been basically the same person after all. But as a matter of fact, we're not. 
Just like as a matter of fact, the last 20 years of my development could have gone differently than they did. I, I could have not become a philosopher. I could have not moved here. I could have not done all sorts of things. But I did. And a lot of that is what makes me who I am. So uh, uh, Parfit thinks this, this is useful for thinking of because it starts to challenge some of these notions we have of that you know, personal identity has to be this, this one one relation, right? Because we can introduce these notions that really um, interfere with that. And this is where he wants to start. He, he introduces another distinction between psychological connectedness and psychological continuity. Psychological connectedness is a direct relation based on degrees. And he says it's not transitive. For something to be transitive basically means that the property, um, wh whatever the property is in question, such as being a particular person, um, if it's transitive, you know, if, if it goes from one to the next and, and the middle one to the next one, right, it has to go across the sequence. So he puts it this way, and this is on page 20. If X Q remembers most of R's life and uh, R Q remembers most of Z's life, it does not follow that X Q remembers most of Z's life. And if X carries out the Q intentions of Y and R carries out the Q intentions of Z, it does not follow that X carries out the Q intentions of Z. All right, so say, say I split, right? There's me and then another version of me, right? And then say that other version of me split and there's there are two versions of him. Now, even though the copy of me, right, or we can think about this as cloning as well, like however you want to do that, right? Um, but maybe I actually, let's, let's go with cloning. I think that's a little bit easier. So there's the original Sam Bell, and then there's clone of Sam Bell. Say we clone the clone, right? Now, the original clone, right, the clone of the original Sam Bell um, has Sam Bell's Q memories and Q intentions and so on, right? He's, he's copied that over. The clone of the clone has copies or, or Q versions of the memories and intentions and so on of the clone. But the clone of the clone doesn't have copies of the original Sam Bell. Parfit says, right, for connectedness, when, when we're thinking about connectedness. Rather, the clone of the clone has copies of the stuff from the clone, and the clone has copies from the original, right? But the, the content from the original doesn't carry through each uh, subsequent iteration. So if you had a clone of a clone of a clone of a clone of a clone, right, the one at the very end would not have the key memories and intentions and so on of the very original person but rather only of the clone that came before them. That's what connectedness is, right? And it's based on degrees because we can think of, of these kinds of steps, right? We can think in terms of, you know, two steps removed or three steps removed or four steps removed from the original. Just like in the splitters case, we can think of, you know, uh, we had A, right, the original, and then we had B, one and two, right? They're one step away, and then B, uh, three, four, five, and six, two steps away, and so on and so on. Psychological continuity instead involves overlapping chains of direct psychological relations. And this, he claims, is transitive. This is something that, that um, holds between them. So ultimately, Parfit thinks connectedness is more important for survival than continuity. So we might look for continuity between all the clones of Sam or right, through all the, the splitters. Right. We could look at the, the continuity that, in fact, they share certain cue memories or intentions or, or beliefs or, or whatnot, right? Um, that we can see how those are, are getting passed through. But the connectedness is really uh, how closely related they are to each other. You know, on the splitters, B30 is farther away from A than B2. Uh, a clone of a clone of a clone of a clone is farther away from the original than just the, you know, a clone even if the clone of the clone of the clone of the clone is in some sense psychologically continuous with the original person right that we can sort of trace uh, these psychological relations back and we can see how they, they move through okay and like i said um if you want some more elaboration on that point i know it's kind of a tricky point um page 20 is, is where parfit is is talking about this now uh, we've, we've still got a, a couple of points here to get through, so we'll try to do that um, in a fairly efficient manner here. Parfit turns to the language of personal identity and what kind of language would be appropriate for different kinds of beings. 
So splitters, right? The ones who, you know, you've got sort of an original and they split into two and they split into two and so on. They would require a new kind of language to track the relations and things, right? It would be hard to instead just talk about what I want and, and be really clear. Um, they could use the language of descendant self and ancestral self to track continuity, right? Whereas they could use uh, future and past selves talk for connectedness, right? And that could help our differences of degree. So we could talk about, right, the splitters could talk about, you know, my most recent self, right? Sort of my most recent iteration had this intention or this memory or whatever, right? Um, my immediate future self, right? Who I'm going to split into, right, is going to have this thing. We can think about ancestral self, so B30, right? A split of a split of a split or a clone of a clone of a clone. I uh, could think about the original Sam Bell, right? And have some sense of, of you know, that psychological continuity. You know, well, I've, I've got this memory that, you know, there's an event that happened to the original Sam Bell and I've still got a cue memory of that, right? We're talking about past and future selves, right? And, and the uh, different sorts of degrees and sort of the, the distance. Just like when we're talking about uh, family, right? We can talk about like immediate family, right? We can, uh, and we can get distance, right? You can go, you know, like, oh yeah, that person's my cousin, or they're my second cousin, or my third cousin, right? You know, oh, that's my grandmother, my great grandmother, right? That, that's a um, similar sort of idea. So we can introduce these new ways of talking to try and track uh, psychological continuity as well as psychological connectedness, right? Um, at some point, there's going to be no relation of connectedness, but the relation of continuity would still be there. So if we're thinking about with the splitters, if we look on the different branches of the split, we could, um, you know, see how there's some psychological continuity going back to the, the source, the original, right, individual Sam or, or whatever it might be. Um, but only the, the clones or the, or the splits on one side of it would continue being connected to each other, right? There would just be no overlap between the one branch and the other branch, right? Other than what happened at the source, but if this kept going and going, uh, eventually it gets so far away that it doesn't matter. Just like right now, if you think about, say, family tree, if you trace it back, right, it's like a few hundred years or something, we say, oh, we have this ancestor in common, right? We wouldn't now say, we're whoa, we're part of the same family, right? Like, you might in some kind of cute sense, but if it's like, oh yeah, we're, we're you know, uh, second cousins, 4,200 times removed, or, you know, something goofy. You know, you're just not really part of the same family anymore. You might share some genetic material, but, you know, if you ran, you know, you, and you ever do one of those sort of genetic sequences, and they say, like, oh yeah, you know, you've got genetic material that comes from, you know, this, this group of people or, or whatever. Right? Oh, you've got some Irish ancestry. It doesn't mean like everybody of Irish ancestry is part of one family. Right? We, we don't now look at that. We say, oh, you're all part of, in some sense, one group, right? Or, or you're somehow con connected to or, or continuous with that group, right? There's this some kind of relation there, but it's not that you're the same or part of the same family. Part of it thinks other kinds of language would have to be used for other sorts of beings. So this is where he introduces seasonals, my term, not his. They fuse every autumn and divide every spring. He says, this, this gets tricky, right? The language of ancestral descendant self that we wanted to introduce for the splitters, right, would, would just capture too much to be useful, right? Uh, because when you're talking about ancestral and descendant selves, if, if every six months you sort of split into two people, um, and then you sort of fuse back together six months later, right? So there's this constant like, like apart together, apart together, apart together. You'd have such an interweaving of, of memories and desires and all these different sorts of things uh, that talking about ancestral and descendants, it would just start, it, it would pull in way too much stuff, right? Uh, so it probably wouldn't be very useful to talk about. But I would cover very little ground, right? You know, if you say, I want this or, you know, I did this or, or whatever, would it only go back six months? Would it go back 12, right? Uh, when there's been fusion and division over the, over the course of that year, you know, five years, 10 years, how far back would it really go, right? Now they probably would use the language of past or future selves, right? They could refer back and say, oh yeah, past version of myself did this or did that, and I've got this cue memory about it, right? Um, 
or you know one of my future selves will whatever right take take care of the i don't know electricity bill right <laughs> after i split or something uh, but he thinks here again the um uh, oh and, and here's the diagram for the the seasonals, right? Now they come apart and come together and come apart and together and apart together and apart together. Uh, and, and what you get is this complex interweaving going on. So he thinks, you know, using I probably wouldn't be very helpful. Using ancestral and descendant cells would be, in some sense, too complicated because it would be taking in too much, right? Every time they come together, every time there's sort of a branching and, and a fusion there. Talk about uh, ancestral and descendant cells, anything you can trace, well, it, as you go back, you would get something like a triangle, right? As you go back, it would just start to take in more and more and more and more and more, and very quickly, not very, you know, be, be useful, right? Tracking that kind of continuity. But tracking the more direct relations of, of past and future cells, and even saying in that matter of degree, right? Well, like, you know, once or twice or three times removed, that could be of use. All right, so we come around to one more thought experiment, the immortals. Everlasting bodies, but changing psychology. So here's what they look like. I'm just going to sort of uh, talk talk this one out. Um, so basically, it's it's an everlasting body, right? So the body continues through time, but the psychology changes over time, and there is some overlap, as you can see on the third line there, right? There's sort of two. Um, what what we get there across the the time dimension, the vertical time dimension, is is two different personalities. Right, or two different psychologies. So you have one, and then as it's fading away, another one is developing, right, and then it fades away. And then we have a bunch of empty lines there, right? Maybe there's just nothing going on psychologically with the bodies for a period of time. Maybe it's five minutes, five months, five years, five centuries, right? if they're truly everlasting bodies. So over time, the psychologies of each body changes, and there's some overlap, but distant areas of the psychology will not be connected at all. These beings would not likely index or connect their personhood to their bodies, right? When using I and talking about what I do or I, right? They would not be referring to the psychology of that body from a thousand years ago, that they have no, no connection to whatsoever, right? No cue memory or, or anything. Right? Effectively, it'd just be a totally different person. Think here when Locke was talking about sharing the same soul with a person, right? Say Socrates, right? Somebody who existed 2,000 years ago or more. And you have no memory or anything, right? of who they were, right, or what they did, you shared the soul or body, we wouldn't think you're the same person, right? So the immortals probably wouldn't use I in this sense um, to refer to their bodies because the implications uh, for memory would just be too ambiguous. Instead, Parfit thinks such beings would likely draw distinctions of personhood depending on the context involved. They might use I for the greatest degree of psychological connectedness and use the talk of earlier or later selves for lesser relations. Right? So, so they might alter the way that they invoke some of these distinctions that part of it is talking about, right? Continuity versus connectedness, ancestral self or, um, you know, um, uh, recent self and so on. So Parfit notes that this revised way of thinking would, not, uh, would suit not only our immortal beings, it is also the way in which we ourselves could think about our lives. And it is, I suggest, surprisingly natural. We can talk about our future and past selves without positing some single self or I that is the owner of all of them, right? That is, there's no underlying person who we both are, Parfit says, right? And this stands in some sense a direct contrast to way, think way back to the start of the course here, we're talking about Descartes. Um, and, and, you know, he's talking about the, the cogito, right? I think, therefore I am, I have to exist and I have to be this thing to, to exist through time. And the whole time I think I must be the same. He thought. And here exactly we have Parfit, right, a few centuries later, giving us an account of, of why that might not be right, why that might be a hasty assumption, why that might not really work the way we want. Is there thinking going on? Sure. Is there doubting? Yeah, right? Are you the same as the whole time you think? Oh, well, not necessarily. Of course, to his credit, Descartes really indicated, you know, look, if, once you go to sleep, once that consciousness sort of shuts off or, or right, sort of stops. Um, once there's a gap in between, we can doubt whether or not we're the same consciousness after we, we wake up, right? It could be the case that our memories are fake or something like that. So, you know, we could try to defend Descartes' position here. Uh, and that would really take us too far afield and get us into Descartes' scholarship and, and right, 
a lot of questions that you don't need to be bothered with for the sake of this course, but are interesting nevertheless. So what are the consequences? Well, ultimately, Parfit thinks that we have to decide questions of personal identity sort of one way or another, and that there are no strictly true answers. Right? Whether or not we dub ourselves I or one of my future selves or a descendant self is entirely a matter of choice, as he puts it. Now, he does admit that there will be some fact about uh, whether or not oneself is an ancestral or descendant self, right? But, like whether or not there are these chains of continuity or connectedness. But which ones we privilege, which ones we think are most important are going to matter depending on context, depending on what the situation's like, right? So what Sam Bell, right, and the various clones of Sam Bell, their, their situation, their context, the way they have to think about these matters uh, and what's really important for these matters is going to help dictate how they have to approach some of these questions, right? Do the, do the clones of Sam Bell, right, and like the one who gets back to Earth, does, does he now have a legal claim to all the original Sam Bell stuff because he's the same person? Probably not, right? Probably there it's worth uh, distinguishing between them. Does he have some sort of right or minimally interest in, in Eve and, and how Eve is? Well, maybe, right? Depending on certainly the older clone who had these sorts of experiences thinking Eve was his daughter and so on. Yeah, perhaps, right? Does that mean Eve has to spend time with him? Well, maybe not. She's her own person, right? But this is exactly it. Now, all of a sudden, instead of having one question, is the clone of Sam Bell really Sam Bell or is he somebody else, right? Parfit exactly is trying to say that it's too quick, right? It's too hasty. These sorts of, of questions don't uh, admit of such easy answers. So Parfit ends with two consequences of his, of his suggested approach to personal identity in one question. So first, as I indicated at the start, the principle of rational self-interest has no force. Because there is no I, right? There's no us, there, there's no individual who exists through time in exactly the same way. It's not clear why we should act in our long-term self-interest, right? Why should we put ourselves first, right? Why should I make uh, choices that favor Carl Lattery rather than you or, or sort of takes everybody into account equally, right? The only way I could really do that is I have to put myself first, right, and make all these decisions that are good for me over time. Well, why do that? Because if in 20 years I'm not really the same person I am now, even if I'm closely related, but I'm not, I'm not really the same person, um, then all those choices I made here 20 years ago, we're really, I'm making choices in the interest of some other person who doesn't exist yet, who's gonna to come to exist and I'm gonna have this legal right to their stuff, but I am literally gonna be a different person to some extent, right? Um, right? Well, does, does it matter? It's a good question, why does it matter, right? So Parfit thinks it's really not clear where we should lock, uh, act in our long-term self-interest once we recognize that we are not this static being that exists through time, right? Um, unless we're just motivated to act in the interests of really everybody, right? And including our future selves, in which case now we're really acting in an impartial fashion. Egoism and related issues, right? So self-interest, when you hear egoism, really think self-interest. They're not wholly natural and instinctive. As Parfit says, he says, egoism, the fear not of near but of distant death, the regret that so much of one's life uh, of one's only life should have gone by. These are not, I think, wholly natural or instinctive. They're all strengthened by the beliefs about personal identity, which I have been attacking. If we give up these beliefs, they should be weakened. And lastly, it's a question, and he ends with a hope. He says, can we achieve the gain of, a, uh, or, or this is my gloss on it, not, not a quote yet. Can we achieve the gain of escaping the negative emotions associated with personal identity, right? These questions of self-interest and you know, all, you know, what if, what, like when I die, right, that fear of, of mortality and so on, can we give up or somehow escape or, or uh, you know, lessen the negative emotions associated with personal identity without simultaneously undermining the positive emotions related to particular selves, right? Uh, of, of, you know, emotions of, of love and kinship, right? Connectedness. So Parfit closes with this, which I think is a, a good note to end on. So my final question is this. These emotions, right, these, these negative emotions, fear, right, and anger, and, and um, right, they're really motivated by kind of self-interest and, and an aversion to loss, right? You know, my loss, your loss. Right? Parfit says, my final question is this. These emotions are bad, and if we weaken them, we gain. But we can achieve this gain without, say, also weakening loyalty to or love of other particular selves. Right? This is asking, can we? As Hume warned, the refined 
reflections which philosophy suggests cannot diminish our vicious passions without diminishing such as are virtuous. They are applicable to all our future affections. In vain do we hope to direct their influence only to oneself. But hope is vain. And Hume had another, that more of what is bad depends upon false belief. This is my hope. Uh, this is also my hope. So what's part of mean here? Well, Hume, 18th century Scottish philosopher, really the, the gloss here is that Hume said, look, we can only uh, try to lessen the negative emotions if at the same time we try to lessen the positive ones. They sort of come and, and go together. Um, and Parfit's saying, well, look, you know, maybe it is kind of a vain hope to think that we can escape the negative emotions that this, this view of personal identity is this, this sort of static thing. That I'm the same person now as I was 20 years ago and will be in 20 or 60 years or whatever. Right? This, this binary sort of one zero relationship. I, you are, you aren't, right? Um, well, once we attack that and see that that's really false, and we really don't have good reason to believe that. In fact, we have much better reason to regard our identities in a, a more nuanced way, a way that, that's more attentive to detail, right? One that takes account of the kind of context that say Dion or, or Sam Bell might find themselves in, while recognizing we are not in that situation. We are in our own sort of interesting, um, different situation where we do change over time. And we are not exactly the same person now as we had been like five or 10 or 15 or 20 years ago. And projecting into the future in five or 10 or 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 years, we're not going to be the same people we are now. Does that mean we shouldn't care about them? No. Parfit thinks, in fact, the opposite. That uh, it's by recognizing that we are not exactly the same being through time, that we start to weaken that self-interest that might motivate us and to achieve a better future for ourselves, because we realize that who we are now is not going to be who we are then. And right? if we sacrifice things now right, um, for someone then, that's really no different than sacrificing something from us now for some other person now. That we can help each other. That really what we need to consider is how we all relate to each other, not just to ourselves. Because we are, in some sense, all in it together. And I think with that, it's a good note on which to close off this course. We've gone over a lot of ground. I could spend a whole other video sort of doing a recap and pulling it together, but I am quite confident that you have the skills to think about that and see the interconnections through all of the, the pieces that we've done so far. So with this, I will simply sign off by saying thank you very much. I appreciate all of your attention all term. I sincerely hope you have enjoyed our course materials, these video lectures, the films we've watched, and taking some time out of your summer to think about some of these rather obscure, uh, in some cases, yet in many cases, very eminently practical topics with me. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to be with you. And until we see each other again, bye for now.